This museum, the Australian Armour Artillery Museum, is top class. Just for an example, check this out. Almost every variant of the uh, Stuart Light Tank series, from the early Stuart Light Tank to the mid-production hybrid to the M3A1 and then on to the M5 Stuart final production before they went on to the M24 Chaffee Light Tank. These tanks were built almost with collectors and restorers in mind. They're absolutely perfect for us. The right size to fit in a shed, the right size to fit on a sensible size truck, yeah, easy to drive, easy to get in and out of, and uh, you can actually, if you can't find the original engine, a suitable truck engine it can power them. They drive fast, they handle beautifully. It's kind of the perfect restorer's tank. The early ones had the early turret, octagonal, very hard to find. They had the early slit type front visors. This casting here was a little different on the later ones. The top of the hull is thinner than the later ones. Bolt holes and positions are different on the early. This is a ram's horn designed for recovering overturned uh, tanks. For some reason, early ones had the holes, but they mustn't have manufactured the ram's horn in time to start punching them out of the factory. So they just riveted up the holes on the early ones. But the museum's one doesn't even have the holes. So it's, it's very unique. Another uh, feature of American tanks earlier on was just put as many machine guns as you could on them and just fill a battlefield full of bullets. So they had one in each sponson, one hole gunner, one up here for the coax, and they even had an anti-aircraft one for the crew commander to fire. Another identifying feature of early hulls is the square back. With these ones sent to Australia, you'll see that the shovel holder has been moved down to the bottom here. It should have the other portion here that the blade of the shovel goes into, but they moved them down. You can tell they're an after factory mod because of the welds, not as neat as the factory type work, but they moved the shovel down so that they could put an external fuel tank out the back. Most of the time it's a fuel tank off of Matilda. And they used that, put it on the back here and got the extra range. This is called an M3 hybrid. These were quite common over in the uh, Australia and New Zealand. When they were producing these, they wanted to punch them out as fast as they could. That was, the demand was so high, they were putting them together with whatever parts they had laying around. And this one here is an early hull with a later type turret. There's no turret basket in there like the last variants had. They weren't kind of up to scratch, so they sort of got rid of them all, the Americans. So we ended up with a lot of hybrids. They uh, welded up the holes for the Sponson machine guns. They even put a uh, stowage bin in front of that one. All of the uh, mods you see were sort of done on the Western Desert and then all of the New Zealand and Australian and the ones that went to Burma. They, ha they had the tropical mods. This is another tropical mod, probably more unique to Australia. It had a shield running around to protect the turret bearings. Yeah, this one was actually mine. I recovered this from a scrapyard. It's the final production of the M3 series before going on to the M5. And you can see it's got actual factory blank offs for the machine guns or even no hole there whatsoever. The production methods from riveted to welding changed in building these tanks. And this one's a really good example because it's really highlighting the shiny stainless welds. They've actually used stainless to plug weld all of the rivets. And the other difference between early and late is there's no side vision port here for the driver. And that, in fact, the plates change in their cut from a step up here in the earlies to a cut right down to here on late. So you actually can't interchange plates. This plate here comes right out to the edge of the sponson, whereas on the early ones, it stops back here and the sponson comes right forward. So a sponson on an earlier one is longer than a sponson on the M3A1. This skirt here is actually protruding on a different angle and longer because of the heavier duty rollers for it to cover. So even little things like that you encounter when you're restoring these machines and, and you think you could interchange parts, but sometimes you can't. There's a story behind this one. After I received it and started rebuilding it, I was finding interesting things with it. And I've come to the conclusion that this was never used. It's a brand new tank. It's a new old stock tank shipped out to Australia from America had its tropical mods done and then put into storage. They can't get in and out of these things after they've uh, prepped them for shipping. Check this out. So, as you can see here, it says cable hooked, brake on, cable unhooked, brake off, meaning hooked onto this tie down point. Right cable turn left, left cable turn right. So obviously, they could unhook the cables and tow them off the ship. And the guy could, I assume, sit up here and just steer it off with pulling on the, the correct cables. This is the shipping data. 
It hasn't been given an ARN, Army Registered Number, so there's no T number issued and there's no unit markings. And also the fact that I've been finding the remnants of Cosmoline would deduce that this is a brand new tank put into storage and never issued. Cosmoline is uh, like grease paper and it's waterproofing where they put it onto any openings or any gaps and stop saltwater ingress. The remnants of that can be seen underneath on the drain plugs and, and any uh, drain holes for the fuel tanks and all that. They haven't actually cleaned it all off. That would indicate this hasn't gone into to a unit and, and some poor sap has that been told scrape all that greasy muck off which gets all over. They hated doing that job. It's a, a horrible job getting Cosmoline off. When I found this one I actually didn't have a rear armour plate and these are quite hard to find. They're easy to chop up and make something out of it. As the farmers always did, so I had to make this. And this is actually uh, hollow. It's two three mil plates rolled in there and outer and the edges put in and baffles put through the centre here to, to stiffen it. And then all of the uh, tool clamps and things welded in place and then patinaed to suit the, uh, the look of the tank. This here, underneath here, you'll see these items here. People don't know what they are. They're actually smoke makers. The crew commander would pull a lever inside which would activate a mechanism and mix the two chemicals. The exhaust would blow it out the back and it's kind of a one-time use thing until you reload it. Mod for the shovel down the bottom here. Petrol oil and water can holders. The uh, tropical air intake which was to protect the mesh screen from the grenades or Molotov cocktails getting thrown in. A fire extinguisher outlet is on the, on the back here. The grouser racks down the side. There's the roll-offs for the external long-range fuel tank. The brackets for that turret guard to go around the bottom of the base of the turret ring. Oh, and this one. <laughs> And this here is a real upgraded air cleaner. And when I got it, it had no bottom on it. These are hard to find because they're rusty and always dented. So uh, yeah, I found a cooking pot that was just the right size and put on the bottom there and patinaed it. Yeah, you wouldn't notice them unless I pointed it out probably. It does the job. Yeah. It was bought by the Haywoods brothers and they bought many tanks back in the day in the 50s to convert to land clearers and bulldozers. What they did was after purchase, they, they pulled the tracks off and I could tell because the tracks weren't on it when I got it and the back guards had bends in them where they just yanked them off and bent the back guards. And then they towed it behind another tank 300 kilometres down from Bandiana to Gippsland, probably more than 300. And you can tell it's been rolling on its wheels without tracks. Just check out the uh, rubber, it's got the bitumen wear on the brand new tyres. They towed it behind a running tank with its tracks through the outskirts of Melbourne and around to Gippsland where they lived. And this would have been only purchased and towed home for spare parts to keep their dozer type Stuarts running because it had no final drives in it and the gears out of the back of the gearbox had been removed, which kind of saved it because it's never done any work. When I first got it, the suspension wouldn't articulate, but uh, after some towing around, it's freed them up. But all these uh, wear plates here have got no wear whatsoever. Normally there's a flat edge on this bush in here. Uh, these are normally flogged out from bouncing up and down, pushing dirt. So this is a brand new tank, uh, never done any work, and the guards are straight. Every mudguard, even if it went into service, is bent because the soldier would run through a trees or the farmers would push trees over. Every guard is always bent up and twisted. These are perfectly straight guards. Unfortunately, when it was left in the scrapyard, leaves sat on it for 50 years and rusted through, but that gives it the patina look. Australia was still an up and coming nation. Everybody was frugal. They didn't have the equipment. They didn't have the manufacturing infrastructure that other countries had. And Australia being as large as it is, it wasn't economical to cut up a tank and ship it all the way to the steelworks. So they were sold as complete units. The, the old farmers thought this will make a good dozer. So they were able to purchase them for very cheap and uh, tow them home, sometimes 30 or 60 at a time. They were towed home, converted into dozers, and they kind of just disappeared into the Australian outback. The best thing now is hunting them down and finding them. I've found 11 of these in my time. I've got another four at home in running condition, and I've got another four to restore. Yeah, this one here, I thought best place for it would have been at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum to put on display in its patina as found look and complete the, uh, the lineup of M3s.